beautiful. Um, good morning, and welcome to Trinity Baptist Church on this unseasonably warm, beautiful Sunday morning. If you are visiting with us today, we'd like to extend a special welcome to you. Um, we ask that you also fill out that visitor's card in the P-Rack in front of you and put that in the offering plate for us so that we can reach out to you and let you know a little bit more information about our church here. Um, if you would join me and open your um, bulletin, there's a few announcements I'd like to go over with you. We do have a special called church conference November 8th um, in the fellowship hall at 6 o'clock. Ladies Night Out will be Tuesday, November 7th, this Tuesday. We will meet at Four Leaves. Hurricane relief donations and college care package collections are also due today. Today is that deadline. Please see the announcement um, about our um, angel trees. Um, you can also find inform more information on that in the gathering area. Children's Choir will meet today at 4 o'clock. And the Youth Praise Team will meet today at 530. Um, today is our Community Fall Blitz. Um, it is here. We have something for everyone. We will start at 2 o'clock and work until 5 p.m. today. Um, please come to the gathering area at 2 o'clock to get directions and more information on where your teams will be going and where you will be working today. Um, we're all very excited about the opportunity to service our church and our also our local community um, with this opportunity. So if you didn't sign up, that's okay. Come in at 2 o'clock today, meet in the gathering area. We'll find somewhere for you to go. Afterwards, we will plan to meet in the fellowship hall for supper at 5 p.m. So everyone who is involved in the community fall blitz today is welcome to come to that as well. Um, if you would, please stand with me now for the passing of the peace. So very glad that you're here. Welcome to worship. join me in prayer. Lord, this morning I pray that you will remind us why we are here today. Lord, I ask that you put us at peace and give us grace to put aside all anxious thoughts and images from the prior week. Help us to focus on you, lean on you, and love the way you do, Lord. You are the Almighty, and we love you, and we're here to praise you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Let us now sing together our song of praise, 10,000 Reasons. You can find the words printed on the front of your worship order. I invite you now to please stand as we sing together. Sing like me. 
Last summer we had a superhero thing for Vacation Bible School, but also on um, Wednesday nights with our children. And one week we talked about how superheroes sometimes have a special place that they go to rest and get ready for the next job that they have to do. So like Batman has the Batcave and Superman has the Fortress of Solitude. When I was a kid, my special place was the creek on our farm. And I've had different places over the years, but um, I've almost always had a special place that felt restful and where I could pray and get ready for whatever was coming next. During this time of silence and prayer, you may think of this sanctuary as one of your places of refuge. But you may also think of places outside these walls where you find rest and where God can speak to you. Please pray silent with me now. Oh God, we pray you help us to seek out those places where we can find rest and reflect and hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture passage this morning is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? May God bless the reading of his word. At this time, our pre-K and our kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of commitment, hymn number 277, Take My Life and Let It Be. Please stand as we sing together.
Please be seated. Good morning. Today's mission moment, I'm going to share a little bit about a local uh, ministry that I've been a part of for 13 years. That's Hope Place. Uh, Hope Place is the local domestic violence shelter uh, of crisis services of North Alabama. We provide a safe haven for uh, individuals and or their children who must flee their home uh, due to abuse. Um, once they arrive, we provide uh, careful danger assessments and safety planning, case management, support group, individual counseling, and then we reconnect our uh, residents back to the community so that they can rebuild their lives. Uh, Trinity has been a long-term supporter of Crisis Services and Hope Place. Um, but today, we're going to step out and we're going to invite you to come to Hope Place if you would like to this afternoon. Um, I will be there to welcome you and open the gates of security. Uh, I have some projects for uh, anyone who would like to come, indoor or outdoor, since we have such a beautiful day. Um, and I just look forward to the opportunity to giving you a personal tour and talking more to you about the work we do there. Um, please pray for me, or please join me in a moment of silent prayer for Hope Place and the other community agencies that will receive your love this afternoon. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> morning it's great to see you today what good music and what a good variety we've had in our open worship and the ways that we 
uh, take the gifts and abilities of folks in our church and their interests and begin to try to blend those into the worship service. And uh, I love the hymns we sang and the praise chorus. And uh, didn't we have a pretty good little organ prelude today? I thought that was great. Uh, I want to mention a couple things before I get to our sermon. One is uh, to remind you, if you open the bulletin to the left side in the bottom over there, you'll see an update on our 30 for 30 giving campaign. Each month we'll give you an update. We kicked that off in October, and I just wanted to be the first to, uh, to announce that. Uh, we've raised $5,980. Thank you so much for your generosity. This is going toward a debt reduction. Uh, we're doing fine on our payments to the bank. We're just trying to get it reduced a little quicker, as you know. And our finance committee did a great job of kicking that off for us uh, as we celebrate our 30th anniversary for the church. And so the idea of $30 extra uh, to your giving in honor of our 30th year as a church uh, is sort of the idea behind the 30 for 30. But I just wanted to give you that update. You'll hear more about it as we go forward. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to have debt reduction for a church, and one of the things that I like is that it's a bridge for us once we can cross that bridge. It allows us to expand some of the ministries that God, I believe, is calling us to do in the church uh, and in our community and world. So just think about that and pray about it and continue to participate and really just appreciate everything you're doing already to support our church financially. It allows us to do the things that, that we're doing that makes us so proud, and I thought the missions moment was right on target today, Tanya. Uh, it's about an example of the ways we impact our community. The other thing is real briefly, I just wanted to note for you at the top in the middle section, I always list the scripture passage and the title for next week's sermon, but I really hope that you'll also with your families or individually think about those questions that we give you as a prompt for next week's worship service. It's a way for you to enter into that devotionally in preparation for each Sunday. So each Sunday you'll have a few questions in there that you can ask with your family or just by yourself and engage in that passage so you come a little more ready to hear uh, the, the worship service and experience in that text of Scripture that day. So let's talk about Elijah. Elijah was a fiery prophet, and his name fits him as well as any name, I think, in the Bible. Elijah means emphatically, God is Yahweh. God is Jehovah. And Elijah is one of those prototypical Old Testament prophets that has a great amount of zeal for God. One of the images that I will always carry for me is when I went to Israel in the 80s and went to the top of Mount Carmel where there is a statue for Elijah. Elijah holds a dagger, a jagged dagger in his hand and it commemorates his defeat of the prophets and the priests of Baal. Uh, the idolatrous God that had invaded into the mindset of the people of Israel in his day. Uh, you might remember he had challenged them to a great contest of whose God is really God and whose God is real. They had two big altars set up and he challenged them to have their God consume the altar in fire. Uh, he uh, doused his with water to make even special the effect. And uh, Elijah was able to call on God and fire came and consumed the, the altar for God, Yahweh. God is Yahweh. But the Baal prophets failed. They couldn't. And then he led this, unfortunately, this massacre of the priests with his dagger in his hand. And that commemorates that. And that's sort of the way I think about Elijah. But Elijah is all over our Bible in many, many places. Jesus once almost uh, directly compared John the Baptist as Elijah come back. When Jesus takes the disciples to Caesarea Philippi, that Roman cosmopolitan area in the northern part of Israel with all the gods and offerings of the Roman world, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? And you remember Peter says this great statement of faith, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, okay, upon this rock I will build my church. But before he asked that question, he says, who do people say that I am? And you know the first person that they mention? Some say Elijah. And when Jesus goes to Mount Tabor for the Mount of Transfiguration, where he is transfigured to the same glory he had before he came to earth, there's a summit on the mountain of Mount Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah is there. And then when Jesus is hanging on the cross, he cries out in Aramaic, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, sabachthani. And as he cries out those words, there are passers-by who say, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. 
Elijah's all over our Bible and connects specifically to the ministry of Jesus. To this day, when Jews celebrate the sacrament of of circumcision, the ordinance of circumcision, they leave an empty chair for Elijah who had such zeal for honoring the ways of God so he would be present in some spiritual sense for the circumcision of their children. And on Passover, a filled cup, a place is set at the table for families as they celebrate Passover just in case Elijah knocks on the door to celebrate that great event for them today. But in our story, uh, Teresa talked about the bat cave and going to the cave of restoration. In our story, Elijah has lost his nerve. The stuff that happened on Mount Carmel with the altars destroyed and the prophets of Baal defeated, he was so excited. His zeal for God that he runs before the royal chariot. He runs all the way to the capital city and announces the priest of Baal had been defeated. But unfortunately, the wicked king Ahab and the wicked queen Jezebel, who supports those Baal priests, puts a price on his head. And he has about had enough. And I would liken what happens to Elijah as ministerial burnout. He is burned out. He has faced a tremendous amount of adversity, idolatry, the apostasy of his people turning away from God. He feels like he's the only one left, and that happens when we burn out. We're working hard, but nobody else is. I'm in this by myself. And so he runs to the place that he remembers where Moses went years and years before and heard directly the words from God. God spoke to him on Mount Sinai, or in this passage they call the mountain Mount Oreb. And he goes to that place and he hides in the cave with the intent to say to God, I am done. I'm through. Just end it for me now. I'm through. And then we have this incredible listening for the voice of God in the usual ways. The earth quakes, the wind splits rocks, and fire somehow burns. But God is not in those great big events as one would have expected. Moses heard of God from a burning bush after all. It is only in, as the King James Version says, the still small voice that draws him to the edge of the cave and he covers his head in sign that he is in the presence of the Holy God. But there are other ways, by the way, to, to translate this, this little phrase here, still small voice. Some of your versions will say a gentle whisper a gentle breeze. One of the versions I like a lot says the sound of sheer silence. And that's what I want to talk about today. What happens for you and me when we don't seem to hear from God? When God seems silent in our lives? Before I get there, I want to just mention, just because God may seem silent to you and me, doesn't mean that God doesn't care for you and me. God always cares whether we hear from God in the ways we might hope or the ways we expect, our lives of faith, I think, are often marked by ebbs and flows. Maybe you relate to that. You have times in your life when your faith seems so real and tangible, you could touch it. You have such confidence and joy in your soul, and you feel so close to God. But you also probably have times in your life when you don't feel that close to God for whatever reason. And so one of the ways God has shown care to us is to give us to each other. It's one of the great reasons for belonging, not just attending, but belonging to a church family. God has given us into the care of each other. There are times when you and I will need to borrow the faith and the confidence of our fellow church members because ours is running low. We'll need to lean on the faith of our church because our faith is ebbing at that point. In this story, we see that God cares for Elijah. As he runs away, there's a uh, sort of a story where he is almost famished. There is a famine that has occurred recently and he's famished and he's sitting there just burned out as he could be. And God sends messengers who bring him some little cakes of food. 
And they say to Elijah, eat it. And he doesn't want to eat. When you're depressed and burned out, you just pull the covers over your head. He doesn't want to eat. And they encourage him, eat, because the journey you're on will be long. And God knows you need strength for the journey. And then he gets there and he pleads once he hears the still small voice, I'm the only one left. And God patiently cares. Doesn't reprimand him, but just reminds him, no, no. In fact, I could count 7,000 right now who are also faithful in the land, just as a reminder that you're not alone. I just wanted to say, just because we don't sometimes hear God, doesn't mean God doesn't care. God always cares for us. And then I wanted to make a, just a brief case for the idea that God does speak to you and me today as often as God did to the people in the Bible. I want to make a case for that real quickly. Have you ever heard these words, nudging, a tug, a moving? You may have said those words about God. You felt a tugging. You had this feeling, this nudging, this sort of something that made you take a step of faith, go do that, not do this. We have a hard time in our vocabulary today, and I don't know exactly why. There's a lot of reasons. Maybe we're a little bit shy about saying, God spoke to me, because we don't want to be like, you know, those people, right? So we're a little shy about it, and we keep our faith fairly private. But many, many of us, and maybe you, have had that, and you don't have exactly the vocabulary. I don't have the vocabulary, but I've sensed God speaking to me in some way. It is part of the conviction of our faith that God is alive, and God continues to communicate to you and me in a variety of ways. I like the title pastor. That's my calling in life. I like what that sort of encompasses. But I know through the years, many people, and I'm happy to hear this too, have said, this is my preacher. It's the preacher at the church. And that's fine. It's a major part of what I do. I have given my life to the proposition that God speaks through the sermon. That God speaks through worship. That God speaks through this book we call the Bible. God has spoken to me that way. Maybe you have read the Bible before, and maybe it's a verse you've heard over and over again, but there's a day you read it and you think, I needed that. God was speaking to me through that Bible. Lydia, one of the great converts of early Christianity, hosted the House of Joy. It was a church in Philippi, the church of great joy, apparently. You know how she became a Christian and how she became the host at her home of the early church meeting in Philippi? She was down at the river where Paul and some other folks were coming and they were preaching the Word of God and she heard God some way speak to her and she was baptized in that river. The Bible and through the Bible and through preaching, God spoke to her. John Wesley says that when a down moment was in his life and he was not even sure he was saved, he was walking by Alders Gate and listened to the church meeting there. They were actually reading from Martin Luther's uh, preface to the epistle of the Romans. You remember Romans and how important that was to Luther. And as he heard that and he heard those words of the Bible, he says, my heart changed. It became strangely warm, and that directly transformed the rest of his life, the founder of Methodism. One of my good friends at Williams, Jim, had to sit for days and days with his wife, Sally, who had cancer, breast cancer. And she suffered for a long time with all the chemo treatments and everything you can imagine, sitting by her bed, wanting his best to take care of her at home as long as he could. And he said to me one day, and it's a verse I've preached on before, I've said before, I'm sure he'd heard it in Sunday school, but he just, he said one day, I came across this verse in the Bible that says, sometimes when you don't know how to pray, the Spirit prays for you groaning with sighs deeper than words. And he said, I needed to hear that. Have you ever had an experience like that? I'm just trying to make the case that God speaks to us. When I was just starting out as a preacher, 
I remember getting a book from the great Wayne Oates. Wayne Oates was still teaching at Southern Seminary, the great founder of pastoral care movement in Baptist life. And he had a little book, and it was uh, timeless words for difficult times. And I thought, boy, as a young preacher, I need this. It'll help me when I'm visiting in the hospital and doing all that. And I thought, I can't wait to see what Wayne Oates says. And I opened it up. You know what? It was just a bunch of Bible verses. And then I said, ah, that's it, isn't it? God speaks to us. The Bible is one of the ways that happens. Fred Craddock once said that he was at an airport in Kansas City and he was sitting beside a guy who was a university professor and researcher. And they got to talking. He said, I've been researching what happens in the operating room. When people, you know, the patient is under and the surgeons are doing the operation. And while they're operating, the surgeons and the nurses talk. And he said, I found out in my research that if there's negativity, they're having a bad day or they're just negative, somehow, even though the patient is under, they wake up feeling grouchy. They don't feel as optimistic. They're pessimistic about even their recovery. But if the surgeons and the nurses are, are talking very positively and they're happy and they're glad in the surgery, then the patient wakes up and has a whole lot better feeling about how things are going to go after the surgery. And Craddock said, thank you for telling me that. He goes, oh, are you a doctor? He goes, no, no, I'm a, I'm a preacher. And he said, that'll be important because if it works in the surgery, it'll work in the sanctuary. And Craddock says, so when I go to a place and people are sleeping, it doesn't bother me anymore. Because I know later on in the week, they're going to get this little Christian twitch. They won't know where it came from, but I will. God still speaks to us. God speaks to us through nature. Think about the many places in the Bible where we are pointed to nature. And that is how God communicates to us. Proverbs says, Consider the ant, you who are the little slothful, and see how the ant is so industrious. Jesus says, Consider the lilies of the field or the birds of the air. And remember how much God wants to take care of you. And we have used that kind of stuff from nature for many, many reasons. The, the butterfly that emerges from the cocoon seems to remind us of the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Easter eggs do that too for us. The pine needle was one of the first illustrations I remember seeing about the Trinity. It's one leaf, but it has three little prongs from it, three in one. St. Patrick used that with the clover for the Irish, we are told. I got a little email from some friends of mine in Israel this week. They, had, they said this year that the Baptist churches, there's only 12 of them in Israel, had baptized 73 people. And they usually baptize in the Jordan River. How cool is that? And they sent me a video and they were baptizing in the Jordan River. And after it was over, uh, one of the girls, Hen, sent me a little thing and her, and her little verse was in Arabic. And I got to get it, you know, got the translate thing going. And it's Psalm 19. This is what it says. In Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They do not use words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. Maybe God has spoken to you through nature, through the Bible, through friends who said something that you know you needed to hear, and it was a word of God to your soul in that moment. An event happens. And how many of us have said, boy, God got my attention then? Our music and the arts, particularly in worship, and you take it home, you don't realize it's with you home, and you're standing around doing the dishes at the sink, and all of a sudden you find yourself humming, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Or you're singing to yourself driving down the road, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King, from Hillsong. Job 33 says this, God does speak now one way, now another, though often no one perceives it. But what if, what if, you're in a place where you really, truly believe God is silent for you. Now, I want to say to you that anybody that has the answer to that doesn't really have the answer to that. 
God is too great and mysterious. So be cautious about it. So I'm just going to offer some possibilities. One is something that many of the great Christians of our heritage have said they've experienced. So if this is you, you're in good company. It's called the dark night of the soul. St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila write about this, this dark night of the soul where there seems to be, no matter what devotions they can do, a silence from God that is often accompanied by melancholia, is what St. John said, melancholy or depression, just something going on with you. And if that's you, you're in good company. Kohela, the great teacher, preacher of the book of Ecclesiastes, experiences this, I think, and says, I have searched and searched and searched, and all is vanity. Listen to these words and see if you can imagine who said this. I'm told God lives in me, and yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. Mother Teresa, you're in good company if you feel that way. What people have said, if they're in that dark night, the silence of God seems so evident to them, is to not try to figure out how to fix it, but pay attention to what you could learn from it. It's almost like if you're going to Alcoholics Anonymous and they teach you, at some point when you hit rock bottom, you begin to realize whatever attachments and addictions you have, things that give you support in life, and they're stripped away, you're at a place where you can sort of understand where the, Jesus says to you, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, now come see me. Maybe that's what the dark night does for people. One guy said, due to God's past dealings with me, I learned to trust him, to trust God's promises over my perceptions. I determined that God, not my doubts, deserve the benefit of the doubt. What sometimes people have to do is just like the airline pilot and they put it in autopilot, you just sort of have to fly by the instruments. Maybe you're going through the cloud and you can't see where you're going, but you have to trust the mechanisms. So you keep coming to church and you keep trying to pray and you keep reading your Bible and you keep trying to help others. One guy wrote this to his daughter who was born during a time of dark night for him. You, Eliana, remind me each day that God does answer the prayers that we pray. And when the night falls and we cannot see, He will bring light when the time's right for you and me. So that could be. Another thought is that there could be actually sound in the silence. When I was growing up, there was a little country radio station in Gadsden, and Mama always had it on every morning, called Big Wax Radio, W-A-A-X, Big Wax Radio. And they played the old, old country stuff. And they had a guy, it was a hokey commercial, and the guy would come on, and he'll say, I got wax in my ears. <laughs> Big Wax Radio. It was sort of a little jingle thing that they did. It could be that God is speaking. It's not that God's silent, but we got wax in our ears. Wax can get in our ears when we get too busy. We get too noisy. We get too preoccupied with whatever else. It could be problems. It could be troubles. It could be good things. And they happen. Sometimes I, I liken it to trying to learn a foreign language. Listening to God is like learning something very different than anything we've learned before. To hear. When I was a kid, for one Christmas, I got one of those electronic sets. You know, it had the little nods and different things. You could connect wires and you could create all kinds of electronic projects. And I loved that thing. I made a radio one time and I thought it was the coolest thing. It had a little bitty earpiece. But I remember how hard it was to tune in to get, and it was like a slide thing or something to get it tuned in. And I think that sometimes is the work that we have to do. To tune in, tune my heart to hear your praise. Tune my heart to hear you. And by the way, my brother particularly didn't like the buzzer I made because he'd be talking, I'd go, zink, he'd talk, and zink. He didn't like that a lot. Mama especially didn't like that. One pastor would get up every Sunday and he would sit there while the choir was singing. He never prepared his sermon and he'd sit there and say, Lord, give me a message. Lord, give me a message. One Sunday, he's sitting there while the choir's singing before he gets up and says, Lord, give me a message. And God speaks to him and said, 
Ralph, here's the message. You're lazy. So maybe, maybe that's a, Mary always says to me this way, I got to keep you on your toes. Maybe God is communicating, but he's shifting around a little bit. You got to get the wax out of your ears. Pay attention. Do some tuning work. That could be it. I will say this. Don't jump to the conclusion that just because you're not hearing from God right now means that God doesn't speak. Don't jump to the conclusion that because God seems silent to me, God doesn't care for me. It could be that this is the dramatic pause, the inhale before the exhale. On Jesus' time with the disciples after his resurrection, we're told that he breathes on them. He exhales on them and says, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace. My peace I give to you. And he breathes on them. So do not let your hearts be troubled. It could be that the silence of God, it sort of reminds me of an old Bill Murray movie, the Meatballs. Anybody ever seen Meatballs years ago? It's two summer camps and they're going to go at it for a big competition and everybody's building up for the big competition. And the Meatballs camp is not going to win. They, just have the, they don't have anybody athletic. It's sort of a silly movie. But I remember Bill Murray one time saying to him before they get to the competition, here's our slogan, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> And they all start chanting, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Maybe the silence of God is sending us the message that what we thought was so important just doesn't matter. And often, isn't that the case? Once we've journeyed on a little while and we look back and say, what were we fighting about? That issue that I thought was so important. It's some things we worry so much about and they don't even come to pass. Silence is also a reminder. That God is God, and we're not. I'm reminded of Pilate on the trial of Jesus. Pilate was trying to get Jesus to speak. Say something, won't you? So you're just going to be silent? His silence was not an indication that God had quit working. God was surely working as Jesus goes through the trial, leading him up the hill of Golgotha to the cross God was surely working. There's a story of a campus minister who had a little girl come, college girl come and visit him one day. She'd never been there before and she came to her minister and she said, I have been in such a terrible state. I got to this school and I failed some classes. I'm lonely. I haven't really been able to connect. I don't have any dates. And I just felt like my life wasn't going anywhere, and so I walked to the river near school and stood on that big bridge and looked down into the dark water. And as I was looking at the water, something came to me, and it said, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And the campus minister said, hmm, where'd you get that? She goes, I don't know. He goes, you ever go to church? Because not nah, well, back in the summers, I'd visit with my grandmother, and she'd take us to Sunday school and church. And the campus minister said, ah, sometimes that's when we hear God. Later on. We heard it. We just didn't hear it in the moment. But later on, we hear it. That verse could be translated a still small voice, a gentle whisper, a gentle breeze are the sound of sheer silence. The fact is, that Hebrew verse is so hard, it is a verse that is beyond us. And that's the life of faith. Trusting in a God who speaks to us, sometimes is silent, but always cares for us. Here's what a preacher that I like says, Barbara Brown Taylor, and I'll close with this. So if sometimes you have trouble hearing the voice of your shepherd, be patient with yourself. Because some days it sounds like a whistle and some days like a cluck. Some days it sounds like a love song and some days like a curse. It's not a voice that always speaks in words, much less complete sentences. But it can usually be heard sometime between your getting up and your lying down each day, leading you beside still waters and restoring your soul. Amen.
Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship. We value community and global missions. And there are programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.